It's Sid297 here for SVTPerformance.com. We're at the 2014 LA Auto Show, and I'm sure you guys have seen this already, the new Shelby GT350 Mustang. We've got an interview coming up with Jamal Hamidi, the chief engineer for Global Ford Performance Vehicles, and he's gonna tell us all about this beast. So, we got to see the debut yesterday, over 500 horsepower, over 500 torque. 400. Oh, 400, okay. See, that's why I have you here. <laughs> Correct me on all this stuff. Uh, seems like you guys threw pretty much everything you could in the suspension, driveline, all that. You wanna talk a little bit about like the stretching out the front end? And... I mean, well, everything we did was about vehicle dynamics and uh, all the way you know, down to the engine choice. Uh, we wanted the lightest possible engine we could find uh, that still made decent power, uh, but power density was uh, really important. Um, the aero, we wanted this to be the, uh, uh, the first uh, true downforce front and rear car that, uh, that we've done, so that, uh, that necessitated change in everything from the A-pillar forward, so new aluminum hood, new aluminum fenders, uh, lowered headlights, uh, the whole nose has been pretty much slammed as low as it could go. Uh, new aero belly pans, um, new functional diffusers. So it, it's really been about throwing the kitchen sink at the car to improve the overall vehicle dynamics. And I mean, that's, that's what a GT350 is all about. It's cool. I saw that you guys have, it seems like, did a lot of smart things to save weight where you could with the aluminum hood and fenders, carbon composite header panel, even uh, the differential oil cooler. Was, how important was weight savings? When... I mean, you know, unless you're going to build a carbon fiber tubbed car, uh, weight savings, there, there aren't a lot of silver bullets for weight savings. And uh, so, you know, in order to get weight out or offset weight add, like from bigger brakes, bigger wheels, tires, uh, it's really about attention to detail and shaving, you know, a kilogram or a pound here, half a kilogram there. Um, is, so we tried to have that philosophy on every new part we touched. Uh, we really pushed the engineers to, uh, uh, you know, to justify how they were making that new part meet all its functional goals, uh, but also uh, how they pushed really to the uh, edge of the envelope for uh, weight loss. I guess that extends to the transmission too, because the Tremec 3160 is a whole lot smaller transmission than a 6060. So, what's the the weight difference on that and? You know how the guys are on SVTP. They're going to buy the car and of course put a blower on it because that's the first thing. You know, 500 plus is good, 700 plus is better. Yeah. At least for their purposes. Uh, is that transmission stout enough for things like that? Or I mean the transmission for sure isn't uh, a, it's stout as a 6060. Uh, this has got a, a, a dual mass flywheel so that, that helps ease a lot of the shock loads going into the trans, but um, for sure, I mean, it, it was, uh, we never even thought about putting a 6060 in uh, just because they're way too heavy. Mm -hmm. Well, on top of that, from everything I've read, the 3160 shifts a lot better. It does, I, you know, it's, um, we've, uh, even our manual shifts are significantly faster on a GT350 than they were uh, on a GT500. And hopefully it takes care of the little second gear nibble situation. That was synchros and guys shifting faster yeah, than there really was a lot trans of, could keep uh, up with. Drive line wind up that uh, would uh, would backlash into a into a hard shift. And now with the IRS, all that stuff is completely different yeah. now. Well, what about the uh, drive shaft? I see you guys are using two piece steel drive shaft. Basically the same thing as the GT and the lesser model cars instead of the, like the carbon fiber used on the previous GT500. Right. Is, what was the philosophy behind that uh, we needed uh, We needed the stiffest drive shaft we could get. And uh, we looked at doing a carbon fiber uh, drive shaft and uh, we couldn't get it stiff enough. Uh, so we went with the uh, two-piece steel. 
And that has to, a lot to do with the RPMs that the... The, the RPMs and the, uh, the uh, flat plane crank engine. Yeah. So, when did the idea come up of using the flat plane crank? Was it, that was always in the mix? Always. Right? Always. From, from day one. Yeah. And, and, I mean, that's a real innovation. Uh, no one's done that uh, long a stroke flat plane crank engine before. So uh, we had to, the idea was there from the beginning, but we had to do a ton of simulation and engineering uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, we could pull it off. So this is is this Ford's first flat plane crank engine? It is. Yeah. Wow. Uh, other than uh, Formula One, uh, like Cosworth DFV. Uh, engines and things like that, uh, but uh, for a production vehicle. for production vehicles, yeah. yeah. So, first production vehicle, and you're going to make it the longest stroke one ever done by a manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. Why not? That's that's called go big or go home. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, so, a lot of changes to the engine were probably necessitated from that. I, I know you guys uh, got the extra two liters from the or point two liters from the Coyote with just expanding the bore and using the spray bore technology from the Trinity engines. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's got the same uh, Coyote architecture, bore spacing, all of that, but it's, it's for all, you know, intents and purposes, it's an all new engine. It's, you know, new intake, new heads, new block, new crank, new rods, new pistons, uh, new pan. Um, so it, it's, it's an all new engine. Yeah. A lot of lot weighting going on in the pistons and yeah. rods and all that. Yeah, our uh, our pistons are uh, actually as light as uh, Ferrari 458's pistons. That's yeah. it's pretty light. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I guess the other big thing is suspension, brakes, and tires on the car. You know, everybody loves the horsepower, but uh, the brakes are and wheels and tires are massive. And you've got the Magrad suspension. So, can you explain a little bit about how the MagRad works? Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, MR or magnetic uh, rheological dampers have been used on a bunch of cars. Everyone's using them now. Ferrari's using them, Audi's using them. Uh, they're on the C7 bed. Uh, even Range Rover is using them now. So, um, you know, and it's, uh, they're, you know, they've got some pluses and some minuses, uh, but the pluses, are that they're so uh, fast to react that uh, you know the sensors can uh, can see what you're doing with the steering wheel and like when you turn the steering wheel uh, it can see that you're turning the steering wheel and change the settings on the dampers before the vehicle has a chance to re to react to the weight transfer of that steering input. Yeah. That's how fast they are. So it just opens up a, a whole nother world of, of tuning ability. Well, that's definitely impressive. And is that something that you think that the aftermarket will be able to tweak a little bit? Or if you guys kind of have it dialed in, do you think it very much as good as it's going to get? Yeah, I mean, there, part? you know, we now have uh, five drive modes. We call them integrated driver controls. So there's five settings that control ABS, t uh, traction control, exhaust valves, the powertrain settings, uh, and the uh, damper settings. So there's a lot of adjustability built into the system already. Um, I mean, I'm sure uh, that there'll be, uh, the aftermarket is capable of anything. So uh, I'm sure people will start uh, playing with them. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's cool. It's uh, you tune the thing with a laptop instead of changing shims. It's yeah. it's really equivalent to going from a carburetor uh, with jets and everything to a fuel injection system. Uh, it's um, it's pretty cool. So on the adjustable settings, will the, basically a novice be able to take the car and in the right mode be able to run a pretty decent number on a road course, and then put it in the hands of a more experienced driver, they play with the modes a little bit and can build up. Yeah. That'll be sweet. Yeah, so normal mode, you know, there's there's a lot of stability control intervention to keep yourself from getting in trouble. Then sport mode uh, kind of, you know, increases that, that threshold of, 
uh, what it'll let the vehicle yaw and the rate at which it'll let the vehicle yaw. And then there's a track mode, which is full off. So, so it just turns everything, everything off? Everything off, yeah. I'm glad that you guys do that. It seems like a lot of manufacturers are getting yeah. rid of the full off. Yeah. You know, can't take all the fun out of driving. Yeah, there, there's still a few heroes out there. Yeah. And uh, the tire choice, you guys went with Michelin's again. And uh, is this a lot better tire than the GT500 tire or similar or? It's a much more balanced tire. The, the GT500 tire had a very narrow window of operation. And, and I know a lot of, you know, I've read a lot of feedback that say they're, they're not, you know, happy with that tire. Uh, and that's usually because they're not using it within its window of operation and at the right temperature, where the Pilot Super Sports are much, much, uh, it's really another world uh, in terms of daily usability and uh, grip in cold weather, rain, things like that. So, you mentioned it's still an extreme summer performance tire, but mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, you know, turn to plastic at 70 degrees. Yeah. You mentioned the exhaust system and the, uh, the valve in. Could you talk a little bit more about how that works? Uh, yeah, there's uh, a couple of electric valves in there, and uh, when the valves open, it's a straight exhaust, basically. And uh, uh, the valve is controlled through all the drive modes. So, you know, if you're normal, the valve is, is usually closed. Uh, but when you're in track mode, uh, it's usually open so and then all the modes in between there's a way plus there's an, uh, a button in the in the car that lets you defeat it so if you want instant flat uh, flat plane uh, music mm -hmm. uh, you just hit the button and there you have it and it basically just bypasses the mufflers and yeah dumps the exhaust straight out two pipes does anybody else do that uh, the 911 uh, the Porsches are doing that seems like you keep bringing up the Germans and the Italians with this car there's I mean there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of technology in the car and uh, you know the the Germans and uh, Italians are Europeans I guess uh, are in many ways on the cutting edge of that technology so uh, what's really cool about the GT350 is I think we're gonna kind of make a lot of that technology much more uh, accessible to uh, you know, to Ford enthusiasts. And that'd be great. Especially, you know, I'm trying to get more into the track driving myself. And the, I don't know why I bought a 2015 EcoBoost Mustang, but it just seemed like a good idea at the time. It's a great, it's a great package. Yeah, well, I like the idea that it's uh, a little bit better balanced to start out with. And uh, being able to just tweak the car the way I want it to get it on the track and then not basically cut up a beautiful GT350 to start yeah, with. Yeah. Maybe take that car and learn a little bit. But well, once I, once the EcoBoost gets boring for you, then then you then can, you have uh, to step up. Then you got to get a GT350. Uh, I would. I'm really interested to see what kind of track times it puts down. Um, maybe we'll be able to get one and uh, get one of our drivers on the site to take it out. Uh, I know we have a Boss 302S. That would be fun to see how it yeah. would compare against that. It, the car holds its own on a track. I would imagine. And uh, you guys tested a lot of VIR. That's a track that a lot of us go to in the area. And a lot of people on SVT beer are familiar with. Beautiful right. track. Yep. Great rolling hills. It's sad that the oak tree's gone. Yeah. But, uh, well, what else do we have to talk about on the car? You've got all, all the cooling built into the front of it now. The brake cooling ducts and everything is built into the front yeah, fascia. The, the front end is fully ducted so uh, we spent actually spent a lot of time and money uh, ducting for the radiator pack so it's fully enclosed from the grill back to the radiator uh, the, the brakes are ducted there's uh, air deflectors um, there's uh, there's aero curtains all the coolers are fully ducted so it, it was really about uh, maximizing the efficiency and this has a transmission oil cooler yeah it's got uh, if you get the track pack you get the trans oil cooler and the engine oil cooler in the front and mm -hmm. the uh, diff cooler in the back yeah it's a great idea putting the diff cooler in the back instead of running those lines all the way to the front and absolutely back. and then the drag penalty uh, you don't have the drag penalty so D I, moving to the uh, carbon composite core support I guess is one of the things that allowed you guys to build all of that into a module. 
Yeah, it's a it's a new carbon uh, composite, uh, and uh, uh, we had to redo it because we lowered the whole nose of the car. But it's uh, a twenty percent uh, carbon composite. Sweet. Well, I think that just about covers it. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Well, I appreciate. Thanks a lot, Travis. Time. Thank yep. you.